<laughs> okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so, okay, you're on, yeah, okay, good. So, um, I have up here problem sets two and three graded along with solutions. Um, uh, you, I ask that you maybe not stare at the problem sets while I'm giving a lecture. Nothing annoys me more. Uh, usually I make people pick up problem sets at the end of class rather than the beginning. Uh, but I don't know. I guess I wasn't paying attention today. Um, yeah, so um, problem sets one, two, and three, along with solutions, have all now been handed out. Problem set four, um, I have, uh, I'm hoping the TA can get it done by Monday, um, along with the solutions. Uh, so hopefully when it's graded, I'll send out an email, uh, and you could probably just pick it up directly from him um, if you would like to get it back before the midterm uh, on Tuesday. Um, if you have any questions um, about the grading, it's probably best to talk to the TA who did the grading. Problem sets one and three were graded by, by uh, um, Loisan, and problem set two and four uh, are graded by uh, Julian. So if you have detailed questions about uh, any of the grading there, you can just uh, go ahead and um, talk to them directly. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that's it as far as administrative things go. I handed back solutions to problem set one um, last class. If you didn't happen to get them, uh, feel free to stop by my office and I can give you a, a copy. Um, okay, um, so um, let's go ahead and do some physics. Uh, unless, are there any other uh, questions of an administrative nature before I get going? I don't think so. Um, good. So last time we began our discussion of non-inertial coordinate systems. So just to remind you, uh, a non-inertial coordinate system is a coordinate system which is accelerating uh, with respect to uh, the usual static Cartesian coordinates. And uh, the uh, distinguishing feature of a non-inertial coordinate system is that there are fictitious forces which appear when you write Newton's laws f equal ma uh, in terms of these coordinates. Now, of course, uh, one could always attempt to solve every problem that you will ever encounter uh, in static Cartesian coordinates. Uh, but very often, um, for certain problems, it is much more useful to use uh, accelerated coordinate systems. So last time I gave an example of a uh, very simple accelerated coordinate system, which was a coordinate system which is accelerating uh, with some, in some linear manner uh, with constant acceleration with respect to the static Cartesian coordinates. So if y is the uh, vertical position measured in a static Cartesian coordinate system, then one could, for example, define some new uh, y variable to be y plus one half a t squared. And so this would describe some new uh, accelerated coordinate uh, with respect to the original coordinate. And uh, the distinguishing feature is that there is a fictitious force uh, because y double dot, the second derivative of the position in the unaccelerated frame, is equal to y double dot prime minus a, where a is the constant acceleration. So um, now, 
such a coordinate system would be useful to use, for example, if I am in an elevator which is being pulled behind a spaceship which is accelerating in the y direction at constant acceleration. So that would be one example of a problem where it would be useful to choose as your dynamical variables the positions in an accelerated coordinate system as opposed to an unaccelerated coordinate system. Now, a second, uh, somewhat more complicated, uh, but much more useful example would be that of a rotating coordinate system. So, for example, if I have a coordinate system which is rotating with some angular velocity with respect to an, uh, my original static Cartesian coordinates, then uh, it is often very useful uh, to use that rotating coordinate system uh, in certain cases. Uh, for example, um, if I wish to study the motion of objects uh, on the Earth, then it is very uh, useful to use uh, the coordinate systems that I would define with respect to the Earth, which is rotating, rather than with respect to some uh, you know, astronomically defined fixed coordinate system uh, that is related in a very complicated manner to the coordinate system uh, of the rotating Earth. Uh, so what we will now do for the rest of this class um, and possibly into next, next class is discuss in a bit more detail um, the example of a rotating coordinate system, uh, which is the sort of prototypical example of a non-inertial reference frame and one uh, that uh, is, is very useful uh, both from a practical point of view and also conceptually uh, very important. Uh, so are there any uh, questions uh, before we delve into the details of physics in rotating coordinate systems? So. Um, I'm sure that you studied uh, physics and rotating coordinate systems in your elementary mechanics classes. Um, I'm also reasonably confident that you don't remember it very well, um, or, or at the very least that you didn't understand it as well as you should have the first time you saw it. I remember when I saw this in my freshman physics class, I thought it was terribly uh, confusing. And, and then it was only later uh, that I realized how simple everything was. Um, so that is uh, really the reason why we'll be returning to it here. Um, are there any questions before I continue? Would you mind? Thank you. Um, any questions? Okay. So let's imagine that we are in some rotating coordinate system. So uh, the positions of objects uh, can be described either uh, using my static coordinate system or my rotating coordinate system. So of course, I can describe the position of uh, an object can be is described by a set of three quantities, which are the component of uh, the vector describing the position of that object. Uh, in a given coordinate system. So if I have a Cartesian coordinate system, I will let Ri prime, where I runs from 1 up to 3, denote the position of an object in our static non-rotating coordinate system. So here, i is an index which runs from 1 up to 3, and um, ri, prime, ri prime is just a set of three quantities which label the different components of the position vector of an object in this coordinate system. And I will let ri without a prime denote the position in a rotating coordinate system. Uh, I am using unprimed coordinates to denote uh, the rotating coordinate system because by and large uh, for the rest of this lecture I will be mostly interested in writing down quantities in rotating coordinate systems and I don't want to have to write primes everywhere 
of course, uh, you could call you could call the unprimed ones static and the primed ones rotating if you like. Uh, this is just a matter of convention. And if R is the position vector uh, of the object under consideration, then we can write it in either coordinate system. So, for example, if we wish to write this position vector in the static coordinates, I would write it as the sum over i r i prime times e i prime, where e i prime is a set of three vectors labeled by the index i, which, which are unit vectors which describe the static coordinate axes. E1 prime would be the static Cartesian x-axis, E2 prime would be the y-axis, and E3 prime would be the z-axis. So here, uh, it is important to distinguish between uh, the vector symbol. So each, so the vector symbol denotes the fact that I have a vector living in three-dimensional space, and there are three of them which are labeled by this index i. And the ri primes are the set of three quantities which describe the components of the vector r written in uh, this static coordinate system. Likewise, if I wanted to write this vector in uh, the rotating coordinate system, then I would just need to choose my set of three rotating coordinate axes and write my, my position vector as the sum of, over i from one up to three of ri times ei vector. So um, is this clear? So far I haven't actually said anything yet, um, but I've taken a long time in doing so. So there's um, a set of words associated to these two different coordinate systems, uh, which are typically, which I will not use very often, but which are very often used, uh, for example, in the textbook and in most other uh, treatments of mechanics. Uh, so if we imagine we have some rotating body, such as some spinning top or, uh, or the earth or something like that, uh, then we can imagine some fixed set of axes, say x hat, y hat, and z hat, which is what I called e1, e2, and e3 prime. Um, so these, and then so these would be the three Cartesian uh, coordinate axes, E, I, prime. And then we could have some, say, some top, which would be some solid body, which could be rotating about some axis. And then the three vectors, Z hat, X hat, and Y hat, uh, could be chosen to be rotating along with this body. So that is the sort of typical um, problem that one should keep in mind uh, for the rest of the lecture today. And because we keep this problem, this particular problem in mind, um, the ri primes are often called space coordinates. Uh, because they're the coordinates of a position vector in, with respect to some fixed static Cartesian space coordinates, whereas the RIs are referred to as body coordinates because they're associated with uh, coordinates, a coordinate system that is rotating along with some uh, rotating body. So, for example, if you look in the book, 
Um, the book will make a big deal about space versus body coordinates. I will generally just refer to them either as static coordinates or rotating coordinates uh, because I think that uh, language is somewhat clearer. Um, okay, so now let's ask uh, the basic question, which is, um, what do I mean uh, when I say that these coordinate, these RI coordinates are related to the RI prime coordinates uh, by a rotation. You know, what does it mean to say that these coordinate systems are related by a rotation? So what it means is that The rotating coordinate axes, EI, are related to the static axes, EI prime, uh, by some linear transformation so that EI is equal to the sum over J of some quantity u i j times e j prime. So here um, you can think of e j as being a vector whose a set of three quantities labeled by an index j, and then these rotating coordinate axes EI are related to the static coordinate axes by the multiplication by some matrix U. So as I think we have already discussed in class, um, matrix, I believe we've already discussed it in class, uh, matrix multiplication can be written in terms of a sum over indices as I have written it here. So you could think of um, the EJs as being organized into a vector, so a vector whose components themselves are three vectors, and then the EI uh, unprimed rotating coordinate axes would be related to these static coordinate axes by the multiplication by some matrix U. Now, I don't tend to write formulas using that matrix notation because I want to make it clear that um, there are two different kinds of vector indices in the game. There are the vector indices that I denote with a little vector symbol, which I am not writing explicitly. And then there's also the i and j symbols, which denote the three different coordinate axes, which I am writing explicitly. Um, is that clear? So um, I've used a lot of very long words to say something which is very simple, which is that in a rotation, the three rotating coordinate axes are related to the unrotated coordinate axes uh, by some linear transformation, uh, u. So here u uh, denotes a set of nine quantities labeled by the indices i and j, which both run from one up to three. And of course, um, there will be an expression for the ej primes in terms of the eis, where we multiply by the inverse matrix rather than the matrix u. So this set of nine quantities, U, I, J, can be thought of as a matrix, uh, which will be called the rotation matrix. And in general, it will be allowed to depend on time. So for example, you could consider the case where the rotating coordinate system is rotating with some constant angular velocity that does not depend on time. But of course, that is just a very simple choice. And there are other coordinate systems which are related to the Cartesian static coordinates by some rotation, which is a complicated function of time. 
And later on in this course, when we consider the dynamics of rigid bodies, um, it will be very important that we are considering rotations which are allowed to depend on time. So given this formula, uh, let's now try and understand how the uh, coordinates of an object in these different coordinate systems are related. So the position vector of an object can be written in the unprimed coordinate system, in the rotating coordinate system, as the sum over i, ri times ei, which using uh, this expression for the eis in terms of the ei primes would be the sum over i and j of uij ri ej prime. And we wish to compare that to our expression for the ri primed coordinates, which was the sum over i ri prime ei vector prime. And so you can see then that the relationship between the primed and the unprimed coordinates is just given by the multiplication by this matrix U. In particular, Ri prime, well, uh, in order to determine what Ri prime is, let's just uh, relabel our i and j indices. So I, the i and j indices are summed over, so I could switch them if I liked, and write this as the sum over i and j of u, j, i, r, j, e, i prime, and then compare that expression to this expression here. And you see that r i prime is r j u j i. Or uh, if we wish to think of this in matrix language, you could think of this as u transpose i j r j. Because the transpose of a matrix just means you switch those two indices. Right? That's what a transpose does for a living. It switches those two indices. So that's how um, the coordinates are related to one another when one does this coordinate transformation. Any questions on that before I continue? I'm doing things that you have seen many times before. I'm using a slightly different notation, possibly because I wish to treat things a little more carefully uh, than you did in your uh, elementary mechanics classes. Um, but I assure you I'm not doing anything that you have not seen before. I see a couple confused looks. Any questions? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. Um, yes, that's why I was getting blank looks. So uh, I should mention a word of warning, which is that um, one very frequently uses a notation where repeated in indices are summed over. And um, I uh, do not wish to use that notation in this class because I don't think it is necessary. Uh, but yet I will often do so accidentally. So please correct me when I use that notation. Um, you probably took Jim's e &M class and he probably used that notation. Am I correct in, in, in remembering this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, any repeated index is summed over, but I will try and remember to write those sums out explicitly. Okay. So this is the relationship between the coordinates in a primed coordinate system versus the static coordinate, unprimed coordinate system. Um, so. This matrix U um, is rather special, and it is known as uh, an orthonormal uh, matrix, and it obeys um, some rather special properties, uh, which you may have seen before, uh, but just in case, I will uh, go through this again. So the 
the matrix Uij has the property that the Eis, the coordinate basis of the rotating coordinate system, will, just like the Ei primes, the basis of the static Cartesian coordinate system, will be an orthonormal basis. Meaning that, so for example, Ei prime dotted into Ej prime will be one if i is equal to j and zero otherwise. And we often abbreviate that by writing the Kronecker delta symbol delta ij. And likewise, ei dotted into ej will be equal to delta ij. So this first equation is something that you already know and love. The ei primes are just x hat, y hat, or z hat. So x hat squared is equal to one. That's the statement that it's a unit vector and x hat dot y hat is equal to zero. That's the statement that these vectors are orthogonal. And the whole point of a rotation is that the coordinate axes uh, for the rotating coordinate system will be orthonormal as well. They will be orthogonal in the sense that uh, ei dot ej will vanish if i is not equal to j, and they will be normalized. They will be normal in the sense that ei dot ej is equal to one if i is equal to j. So is that so? That is, uh, in some sense, the definition of a rotation. Uh, a rotation is defined such that the coordinate axes, uh, which started out as um, orthonormal in the unrotating coordinate system, will stay orthonormal after the rotation. And this puts a condition on uh, the rotation matrix U. So let's remember that EI was the sum over J, UIJ, EJ. So let's just evaluate this second expression using that formula. And so EI will be, let's call it K instead of J because I don't want to mix up my j and k indices. So ei will be the sum over k, ui k, ek prime, dotted into the sum over l of u j l times e l prime. That has to be equal to delta ij. And now using the first equation here for the dot product between EI and EJ prime, this is equal to the sum over K and L, UIK, UJL times delta KL which is just equal to the sum over k of that same expression uik, ujl, now with l set equal to k. Is that uh, set of manipulations clear? Delta kl is equal to one if k is equal to l and zero otherwise. So when I sum over both k and l, I need to set k equals l or else I get zero. And this just becomes the sum over k. Yes? Uh, probably. Uh, where am I missing a Oh, I'm sorry. That's a prime. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes, please uh, interrupt me uh, if I make any mistakes such as that. And you don't have to call me sir, although it does flatter my ego. Um, any other questions? Okay. So if we think, uh, so it's probably useful uh, to remember how to write this formula in our more familiar matrix notation. So let's remember that 
in matrix notation, if I have uh, a matrix A uh, whose components I would write as Aij, and a matrix B whose components I would write as Bjk, if I were to write Aij, Bjk, and sum over J, then that is just a fancy way of writing the product of the two matrices, A and B, uh, with indices I and K. So that is just another way of writing the I, K component of the matrix uh, A, A times B. If you think about it, all that matrix multiplication is, is you know, you take one index of one matrix times another index of another component of the second matrix, and then you sum them all together. And so that this formula here is just the definition of matrix multiplication. If that's not clear, I recommend uh, that you, uh, tonight, uh, as you are uh, lulling yourselves to sleep, uh, you try and prove this formula to yourselves. So what that means is that this formula here, which says that the sum over k of uik, ujk, is equal to the Kronecker delta symbol, can be written in matrix notation as follows. u times u transpose is equal to the identity matrix. Delta ij is the identity matrix. The sum over k is matrix multiplication. And the fact that this second matrix is ujk rather than ukj means that I'm multiplying u times its transpose rather than u times itself. So um, this means that in order for the matrix u to describe a rotation which takes orthonormal vectors to an orthonormal basis of vectors, this matrix u must uh, obey u transpose is equal to u inverse. So u times u transpose being 1 is the same as the statement that u transpose is u inverse. And such a matrix is known as orthogonal. In your linear algebra class, you probably saw this definition of orthogonal matrices. Is that correct? You've probably seen it somewhere before. If you haven't, you're seeing it now. Um, I won't assume that you've seen this before. Everything I say in this course will be completely self-contained. So the matrix U um, obeys U transpose is equal to U inverse and describes a rotation, uh, there's a little bit of language that people use to describe the set of all possible rotation matrices. So the set of all possible rotation matrices which is to say the set of all U such that U transpose is equal to U inverse is known as the orthogonal group which is denoted O3. Uh, now of course I won't uh, need to use this notation uh, in this class um, but I introduce it because it's an important notation that you will run into again and again throughout your uh, lives as physicists. Sometimes, um, so the orthogonal group is the set of all three by three matrices whose transpose is equal to their inverse. So because U transpose is equal to U inverse, that means that the determinant of U transpose is equal to the determinant of u inverse, which and the determinant of u transpose is equal to the determinant of u, and the determinant of u inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of u. 
So that means that the determinant of u is equal to its inverse, which is only true if the determinant of u is equal to plus or minus 1. So an orthogonal matrix is a matrix uh, whose determinant is equal to plus or minus 1. And um, there is an additional uh, notation that people use. So the set of orthogonal matrices can be divided into two parts. It can be divided into those with determinant plus 1 and those with determinant minus 1. And the set of orthogonal matrices with determinant equal to 1 have a special name. Uh, they are called special orthogonal matrices. Uh, and the set of all such matrices is called SO3. So you may have seen uh, SO3 before, even though uh, you it may not have been called that. For example, in your quantum mechanics class, when you study the algebra of rotations, that is often referred to as the SO3 algebra. Sometimes it is also referred to as the SU2 algebra, even though those are actually the same thing. Did you guys see that in your quantum mechanics class? You did not see that. Okay. Well, um, but you saw, you probably have encountered spin in your quantum mechanics class and encountered the Pauli matrices and all of that stuff. So the Pauli matrices uh, form what is known as the SO3 algebra or the SU2 algebra. And in fact, many of the formulas involving rotations in classical mechanics are very similar to those which you have already encountered in your quantum mechanics class. And so that is a theme which we will return to uh, several times in this course. However, um, for practical purposes, you don't need to remember this fancy uh, nomenclature of orthogonal and special orthogonal matrices. I simply bring it up to make you uh, better, wiser, uh, more educated physicists. OK, any questions on that? No questions? Okay, so the important point is that this orthogonal matrix U, which describes the rotation that we are considering, is in general going to be time dependent. Um, and this will lead to all sorts of interesting uh, effects. So, uh, for example, let's imagine that we have some object with position vector r. Then, as I have described, I can write uh, the coordinates of that object either in the rotating coordinates or in the unrotating coordinates. Now, let's imagine that I wish to calculate the velocity of this object. Then r dot, well, in the unrotating coordinate system, that's very easy to compute. So let's first consider the unrotating coordinate system. So the Components of the position vector in the unrotated coordinates, which is to say the EI prime coordinates, will just be RI prime dot times EI prime. Right? The EI primes are fixed. They are just the uh, basis vectors for Cartesian three-dimensional space, which do not depend on time. But... If I wish to write this velocity vector in the rotating coordinate system, I need to take into account the fact that the basis vectors for the rotating coordinate system depend on time. So this will then be the sum of two terms. One term where I take the time derivative 
of the RIs plus a second term where I take the time derivative of the basis vectors. Is that clear? This is just, uh, I haven't done anything fancy here. All I've done is use the product rule. So let's now go ahead and try and understand what the time derivatives of these rotating uh, basis vectors for the rotating coordinate system are. Well, this is d by dt of u i j e j summed over j, sorry, which is the sum over j u i j dot e j. Sorry, with the pr primes there, because I'm writing it in the uh, static coordinate system. Now, this uh, is, of course, just the matrix U dot. So U is a matrix. So U dot is also a matrix. So this is the matrix U dot times E prime. And if I wanted to, I could write this in the unprimed coordinates, in the rotating coordinate system, as the sum on j, u i j dot, times, uh, well, what is e j prime? I would like to write that in the rotating coordinate system. So that will be the sum on k of u inverse k j e K, sorry, J K, E K, right? Because E I is equal to U times E I prime, and E I prime is equal to U inverse times uh, E I. Or if I wanted to write this using matrix notation, it's the sum on J of U dot u inverse, which is the same as u transpose, ij, ej. Is that clear? In going from that second line to the third line, I've used the fact that the sum over k is the same as matrix multiplication, and I have replaced the k index with a j index. You know, they're both summed from one up to three. So I could call them whatever they like. I could call them L. I could call them uh, banana if I liked. Sum banana from one to three. Banana equals one plus banana equals two plus banana equals three. Okay. So that means, just to uh, summarize, that R, uh, that the vector R dot can be written in the rotating coordinate system as the sum of two terms. So there's ri dot times ei plus the sum over i and j of ri u dot u transpose ij e j. Or if I wish to uh, write this a little more concisely, I could in that second expression uh, relabel my i indices as j and j indices as i to write this as r i dot plus u dot times u transpose j i R i times e i. Oops, I mean j there. Of course. Here, yeah, let me write that a little more clearly. So, what this means is that this is something that you already know, of course, 
from your previous encounters with rotating coordinate systems, which is that if you want to write the velocity vector in a rotating coordinate system, you don't just take the time derivative of the components of the position vector written in the rotating coordinate system. You have to include a correction term which takes into account the fact that your coordinate system is rotating. Even though I appear to be sitting here uh, with zero velocity, I am in fact sitting here with, uh, at a constant position in a rotating coordinate system. So if you wish to compute my actual velocity, you need to take into account the fact that I am static, but with respect to a coordinate system that is rotating uh, around uh, the Earth's axis. Um, any questions on that? I'm going a little slowly through this because this is something that people often encounter in their uh, introductory mechanics classes and never quite understand. And I think it's worth going through uh, slowly and carefully enough that it is completely clear uh, how simple all of this is. So any questions before I continue? Okay, so um, what is this guy here? So this is, um, U is an orthogonal matrix, so its inverse is equal to its transpose. And what we have discovered is that when we take the time derivative of a vector and write it in this rotational coordinate system, we have some new matrix which appears, which I will call A, that is U dot, times u transpose. And this describes the correction term to the velocity uh, computed in this rotating coordinate system. So this vector a uh, is something that you have encountered many times before in your life, although uh, it is perhaps not immediately apparent yet. So uh, let's look at this uh, matrix a. So the first thing that I would like to point out is that this matrix A uh, has a interesting property, which is that A is an anti-symmetric matrix. So why is A anti-symmetric? Well, let's start by remembering that U times U transpose is equal to one. So this is a matrix equation. U is a function of time. So let's take the time derivative of both sides of this equation. So the time derivative of the left-hand side is evaluated using the usual product rule. So it is the sum of two terms u dot times u transpose plus u times u dot transpose. And that is equal to zero because the time derivative of the identity matrix is equal to zero. So this first guy here is just A. And my claim is that the second guy here is just A transpose. Why is that? Well, A is equal to U dot times U transpose. So A transpose is U dot times U transpose transpose. And just remember your rule for taking the transpose of products of matrices from linear algebra. You just reverse the order of the matrices and then take the transpose of the original matrices. So A transpose is U transpose transpose, otherwise known as U, times U dot transpose. So that is exactly as I have written it up here. So what we see is that A plus A transpose is equal to zero. For A is minus A transpose. That means that the matrix A is anti-symmetric. Any questions on that? 
you are perhaps not used to studying uh, the derivatives of matrices. But so, for example, uh, you might not be entirely uh, prepared to see uh, me treating u as a variable whose derivatives I take. Um, but that is only because uh, you have not had the chance to look at uh, matrix differential equations uh, in your life yet. Uh, that will change on the next problem set. Um, but let me assure you, uh, if it's not entirely apparent, that, for example, I can use the product rule for taking the derivatives of the product of functions uh, just as well for taking the derivative of the product of matrices. Um, if that's not clear to you, write out the definition of the product of matrices and take its derivative, and you'll see that the product rule applies. Any questions? Okay. So A is a three by three anti-symmetric matrix. So it's a three by three matrix, which is anti-symmetric. So that means that its diagonals are all zero. And the matrix is uniquely determined by its values on the upper triangular region. So it's determined by its three values at the positions 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 1. So let me give a name to those three values. So let's call them minus omega 3, omega 2, and minus omega 1. And then, because the matrix is anti-symmetric, uh, the other components are found by just flipping around the axis and multiplying by a minus sign. So this is just... Uh, so any 3 by 3 anti-symmetric matrix can be written like this. So in index notation, this formula is just a statement that A i j is equal to the sum over k epsilon i j k omega k. Epsilon i j k, as we have seen before, is the uh, anti-symmetric object, which is either 1 or minus 1 if i j and k is an even or odd permutation of 1, 2, and 3, or is equal to 0 otherwise. So this, what is this omega k? That is a set of three quantities. So if I have a set of three quantities, then it's natural to think of them as a vector. So let me define the vector omega, which is the sum over i, omega i, e i. And I will give a name to this vector. I will call it the angular velocity. If I have a rotation matrix U, which depends on time, I compute U dot times U transpose. That is an anti-symmetric matrix, which means that it is parameterized by these three quantities, omega K, where K runs from one up to three. And then I can from that define the quantity that I will call the angular velocity vector whose components are omega i in the rotating coordinate system. So these omega i's are the components of omega in the rotating coordinate system. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Yes? For the matrix that you define using the epsilon tensor, mm -hmm. uh, A12, for example, that's... Come out to epsilon one, two, three, w, three, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm not being very careful uh, about. Yeah, okay. Do you want me to change my signs here? Do you like them better that way? Okay. Uh, you know, if that's what it takes to make you happy, we aim to please. Um, 
You know, uh, I never remember. It's just a matter of notation whether you call the this in this component here the one two or the two one component of the matrix. I tend to not actually pay attention to any of those things and just call it whatever I like. Uh, so yeah, okay, we can put some signs there. That's fine with me. Um, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so given uh, this uh, definition, let's go ahead and rewrite these two formulas that I wrote down above. So let's look at that first formula. This first formula says that EI vector dot is the matrix A times EJ. So EI vector dot is the sum over J AIJ times EJ. Or the sum over J and K of epsilon IJK omega K EJ. And you will remember that uh, the cross product is defined so that E K cross E J is epsilon I J K E I. So I have permuted uh, the indices of the epsilon symbol there. Remembering that I can always permute them, those indices cyclically, or I can always switch them uh, twice without changing signs. And so this formula for EI dot can then just be written very simply as the cross product of omega and EI. Is that clear? Just using this formula here for the cross product of two vectors and my definition of the angular velocity vector. Questions? So uh, the rule for the cross product is that the index should be k, j, i, ash, i, j, k, j, i, no, i, k, j. Ah, yeah, Christ, is there a minus sign somewhere? Okay, that's probably, oh, I know, that's probably why I put some minus signs up here. Okay. Perfect. Yes, left as an exercise for the reader. Okay, <laughs> now I remember why I put those minus signs there. I put those minus signs there to precisely cancel the two uh, mistakes that I made, so that the, that would cancel out the mistake that I made, um, and so that EI dot is omega cross EI. I have to keep you guys awake somehow. It's not my job to keep track of the signs. That's your job. I could figure out all the signs if I wanted to. <laughs> good, good question. Sorry about that. That's why I put these minus signs in. Yes. In fact, I can even see I had a minus sign there that I then uh, scratched out for some reason. Okay. Good. Sorry. There's so there's no minus sign there. Yes. Good. Or maybe there is no. There's no minus sign there, but there is a minus sign there. Good, thank you. Um, yes, I encourage you all to go through and keep track of all of the signs. Any other questions? Okay, so now let's look at the second expression. So r dot was equal to the sum on i, r i dot plus 
the sum on J, A, I, J, sorry, uh, R, J times E, I. Did I make a mistake there? I think I just copied down this expression up here. Yes. Sorry, A, J, I, I guess. And using our definition of the angular velocity, this is just the sum on i of r i dot plus omega cross e. So that's why uh, we use this, uh, that's why we define the angular velocity vector because it makes it extremely uh, efficient to write down expressions of this sort. Any questions on this formula? Hopefully I now have the signs right. I had an AJI, I pick up a minus sign if I switch the two indices because it is anti-symmetric, and then there was a minus sign that went into the definition of the angular velocity. And hopefully I've only made an even number of sign mistakes in this formula. Okay. Now, I should make an important point here. So, this formula that I have written is true. I have been talking about R as the position vector, uh, which I am taking the derivative of. But this derivation... is true for any vector. So if I have some vector v, which can be written in uh, static coordinates as v i prime, e i prime, or in rotating coordinates as the sum over i of v i e i, then if I want to take the time derivative of that vector, then there are two terms that I need to take into account when I compute that time derivative. There is v i dot, the time derivative of the components of the vector in the rotating coordinate system, plus v i times, oh, I'm sorry, you guys should correct me here. There was an RI there. I trust, I count on you guys uh, to point out all of the mistakes that I make. Uh, so you really let me down there. Um, plus VI times omega cross EI. So there are two terms that one needs to take into account when taking the derivative of any vector you need to take into account the derivative of the components of the vector in your rotating coordinate system. But you also need to take into account the fact that your coordinate axes in the rotating coordinate system themselves are time dependent. And this leads to an additional term, which is perpendicular to uh, the EIs, and which is given by omega, the angular velocity vector, across the EIs. Uh, is that clear? Um, yes. The additional term comes from the Coriolis force. Uh, as we will describe momentarily, these are related to the Coriolis force. But yes, we'll come to that uh, within the next 60 seconds, unless there are other questions. OK. So. For example, if I have an object whose position is given by R vector, which can be written in the rotating coordinate system as R I E I then the velocity vector, ri dot, 
is given by this formula. The sum over i, ri dot plus ri omega cross ei. So that's just uh, the uh, derivation I went through before. But now I could imagine taking the time derivative again. So r dot is just a vector, which is the velocity vector. Now let's take the time derivative of the velocity vector to get the acceleration vector. And we see now that this will be the sum of various terms. So just using uh, this prescription I wrote down above for taking the time derivative of any vector, apply that to the vector r dot, the velocity vector, and we have the acceleration vector is the sum of four terms. So there are first the terms that arise by taking the time derivative of the components of the velocity vector, which I have written here. So there is an r double dot i plus r dot i omega cross ei plus r i omega dot cross ei, then plus the additional two terms, which come by taking the components r dot i plus r i omega cross crossed with omega. Or just cleaning this up a little bit, the sum on i r double dot i, there are now two terms proportional to r i dot omega cross e i, a term that is r i omega cross omega cross e i, and a term which is r i omega dot cross e i. So this is the expression for the acceleration vector written in rotating coordinates. And this leads to all of the fictitious forces that you encountered in your elementary mechanics classes. So, for example, let's say that I were to define the following vector, which was the sum on I r i dot e i. So this is not the velocity vector. It has really nothing to do with the velocity vector. It is just uh, the set of three quantities which describe the time derivative of the position of the object in rotating coordinates packaged into a vector. But from the point of view of the rotating coordinate system, for uh, the coordinate system that is ro the rotating along with the body, uh, this is something that you would think of as the velocity vector. And so it is sometimes called the body velocity. It is the velocity that I would normally measure in the rotating coordinate system. And likewise, the acceleration vector in the body coordinates, uh, I could define the second derivatives of the components of the position vector in the rotating coordinate system, and I could package them into something that I would call the body acceleration. And then the true acceleration vector will be the sum of four terms. 
it will be the body acceleration, which is this uh, stupid thing that is obtained by taking the component, the position of a object in the rotating coordinate system and just taking two derivatives, forgetting about all of these other contributions due to the rotation of the coordinate system. And then I add to that three terms. Oops. So there's omega cross V body coming from that second term. And omega cross omega cross R term, which is the third guy. And an omega dot cross R. So um, what this means is that if I were to write down Newton's laws, F equals MA in terms of a body, the body acceleration rather than the uh, true acceleration vector, there are three new terms. Uh, for example, uh, there is this omega cross omega cross r term, uh, which is known as the centrifugal term, which gives us the centrifugal force that was mentioned earlier. There is the omega cross v term, which gives us the centripetal force. And the omega dot cross r, which gives us what is known as the Euler force. So um, this, uh, so what I have done for you is I have just derived for you uh, again uh, the usual uh, fictitious force terms that arise in a rotating coordinate system. Um, are there any questions? Um, so, you got? Did you guys see the Euler force in your? You never saw the Euler force. That's a cry and shame. So, um, yeah. So usually, uh, yes. Did I make a mistake? No, I'm just Yeah, if, if you want to be careful, we could write it like that. Yeah, we should probably be careful. Uh, yes, I should probably put that parentheses there. Uh, the cross product's associative, however, so it doesn't really matter, but... Yeah, it doesn't actually matter, but um, yeah. Yeah, so um, you, of course, probably recognize the centrifugal and the centripetal uh, forces from your uh, elementary mechanics class. Um, in those cases, you probably only considered uh, coordinate systems that were rotating with uh, constant velocity, angular velocity. Um, if you had been a somewhat more general and considered rotating coordinate systems, with a time-dependent angular velocity, you would have also encountered the Euler force. Um, people often don't discuss the Euler term, uh, which is an omega dot cross R term, because uh, for the Earth, for example, it is uh, absolutely tiny. And I believe that there is a problem on the next problem set where you will estimate the size of the Euler force and verify that it is indeed absolutely tiny. Um, but it is there, and there are circumstances uh, where it is uh, important, uh, although not uh, the Earth, not on Earth. Um, are there any uh, questions? So um, what I would like to do now um, is, you know, so what I would like to do now is, first of all, um, I would like to uh, just for clarity's sake, prevent a completely alternative derivation of the centrifugal, centripetal, and Euler terms. Um, in particular, uh, one of the nice things about the Lagrangian uh, method of writing down equations of motion is that you really don't have to think very hard at all. And in fact, uh, one could derive these various terms simply by writing down the Lagrangian 
of some free particle using some rotating coordinate system rather than some non-rotating coordinate system. Uh, that's an exercise uh, that I think is very useful, um, and it's one that I will would like to present to you just because um, it will uh, hammer into your minds um, the uh, simpleness of these terms. Um, and also, I would like to go through and just go through quickly a few different examples. Um, I, will like, I would like to describe a few examples of the Coriolis and centrifugal terms and work through another famous problem, which is that of, of Foucault's pendulum, Foucault's pendulum. I never quite know how to pronounce it. Foucault is the philosopher. Do you also pronounce Foucault? Uh, you guys probably know. The physicist, it's Foucault, I assume. Not, it's Foucault. They're all Foucault. Okay, good. Um, okay, so that's what I would uh, like to do next time, um, because I think I only have three minutes left, and I wouldn't be able to do justice to any of those topics this class. Um, are there any uh, questions before I conclude? Yes. Uh, is, that, is it possible that we have a Yeah, maybe let's discuss that now. So what I could do is I have about 30 to 45 minutes worth of stuff to do to finish um, rota rotating coordinate systems. So I could spend the remaining 45 minutes of class next time uh, doing a review session, or I could spend the whole hour and a half next time doing a review session. Um, you know, what I was planning on doing was just doing a lightning review of everything that we have done over the last four weeks. Uh, it shouldn't take more than 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, I don't know. Um, and then I could just ask for questions. Um, so what would you prefer? Would you prefer a 35, would you prefer a 45 minute review session or a, uh, hour and a half review session, 80 minute review session next time. I would tend to only do a 45 minute review session, um, but that's up to you. I feel like we're on, you know, we're totally on schedule, so I'm not worried about falling behind um, in this course. So does anyone have a preference? How many people would like to spend the whole time doing a review next time? How many people would not like to review at all next time? How many people are asleep and will not raise their hand no matter what I say? <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, how many people would like me to spend half of a class reviewing next time? Okay, a lot of the people who are asleep and said they wouldn't, wouldn't raise their hand no matter what I said. Okay, um, I'll spend half the class reviewing next time. Um, good. Yeah, and if you have any uh, administrative comments about the midterm or something, you can ask next time. Uh, good. Okay, so I have second and third problem sets here along with solutions uh, for those of you who didn't pick it up earlier. Uh, there's a very good chance. Well, I mean,